The 1980s marked a big cultural change in many aspects of America, and it's a decade generally well-loved, especially by people who were kids at that time. But make no mistake, plenty of terrible things happened in the 80s as well, and of course, the dialectic progressed. Apparently sometime in that decade, a man named Louis Griggs, not the Griggs from the earlier court case, coined the phrase diversity and inclusion. He was concerned with being too ethnocentric and wanted America to focus on multiculturalism. A black friend of his apparently told him that America wasn't ready for that, even though this was nearly 20 years after desegregation. If you take the leftist track of history though, America has always been and always will be systemically racist, and no amount of sacrifice by MLK or Malcolm X could have fixed that. 1981 was a sort of eclectic year for neo-Marxist history meaning that a variety of ideas were pulled into the mass of leftism from a variety of sources. First, Henry Giroux wrote Ideology, Culture and the Process of Schooling. His ideas were built on the work of Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator. Freire had written Pedagogy of the Oppressed in 1968, which was translated into English in 1970. Pedagogy is best understood as the approach to teaching, so you can see how critical theory entered into education just like Antonio Gramsci had prescribed. Freire's book included a detailed Marxist class analysis and is the third most cited book in social sciences. Henry Giroux treated Freire like some kind of godly figure. While he wasn't as direct as Freire, who cited Lenin and praised Mao, Henry Giroux cited Horkheimer, Marcuse, and Adorno in his work. Between these two works, the traditional pedagogy was replaced by critical pedagogy, and the counter-hegemony brought education into its fold. The cultural Marxist revolution takes place in steps. Nowadays, some may say that Marxist teaching wants to replace the family with the state, but that isn't exactly accurate. The institution is the middle step between those two, which is why parents are being told they need to listen to the schools, and why teachers are emboldened to dictate the lives of their students. The schools will eventually give way to other institutions, and lastly to the state, which will control all as in George Orwell's 1984. At the same time all of this was going on, Jean Baudrillard wrote Simulacra and Simulation, which is basically The Matrix. If you've seen The Matrix, you've seen Simulacra and Simulation. Literally, the book is featured in the beginning of the movie before Neo meets Morpheus. Baudrillard's book was mostly a warning, not advocacy for simulation theory. He believed there was a sort of hyper-reality, something more real than real. This hyper-reality is formed socially and linguistically, through social interaction and language, but we choose to live in this hyper-reality instead of the real world. Imagine someone who chooses to live as some sort of internet avatar instead of the real selves, just like Ready Player One, or Second Life, or The Matrix. Baudrillard also said that there was a major focus on race within this framework, meaning that people would choose to live as their race instead of their being. A black American doesn't live as a human who lives in America and is black, but as a black American human. Let's put a few of these milestone books together. Because of Freire and Giroux, the public education system could then teach its students to deconstruct their realities with Derrida, focus on power struggles with Hegel, Marx, and Marcuse, criticize everything with Horkheimer, study race with Baidol and Katz, and choose to live in this hyper-reality that Baudrillard had described. And all of this was true using Leotard's legitimation by pyrology, meaning that consensus made right, and was allowed by several powerful court cases over the prior few decades. Lastly, in 1981, some of H. George Fredrickson's social equity work had paid off with the introduction of the Professional Standards and Ethics Guide for Public Administrators published by the ASPA. The essential takeaways from this policy were the following. Social equity had been made the third pillar of public administration and was to be implemented by two standards. First, to recognize that citizen A is equal to citizen B. Great, sounds good. And second, when citizen A and citizen B are unequal, citizen A is to be made to be equal with citizen B. This contradiction makes no sense for the people who realize equality and equity are polar opposites, but it's perfectly fine for the people who want to accelerate the contradictions, like Lenin said, or in more relevant terms, progress the dialectic. Any policy on DEI in public administration, or private for that matter, will start by acknowledging that people are equal. 
this is Fredrickson in plain sight. Then they will go on to advocate the recognition and acceptance of fundamental differences, and for change when those create inequity. This is also Fredrickson. Now you know the basics, comrade. A few years later, Bell Hooks published Feminist Theory from Margin to Center in 1984. There was a fascination of hers with margins and centers, of course, since everything is a power dynamic. The powerful are in the center, and anyone not a part of that group gets marginalized. You will see that the journey from Hegel to Hooks over a length of 177 years is a straight line. She writes that ideas and theories, just like Hegel said, are essential this time for effective feminist movement. This movement will mobilize people to change society, straight from Horkheimer as well. Revolutionaries seek to make society better, and thus need the revolutionary philosophy of dialectics. They also need a body of ideas, an ideology, based on finding and changing the contradictions in society in order to reach a higher reality. Boom. Critical theory. I mentioned the year 1986 in part 3. Here, that foreshadowing comes to fruition. Critical race theory, though not yet called by that name, would be birthed out of the critical legal studies movement in 1986. The object of the critical legal studies movement since the late 70s had been to use critical theories and point out and undermine dialectical contradictions found within the US legal system. This was on mission directly from Antonio Gramsci, and many of the people involved had worked tireless careers to achieve their goals. However, the whole movement was about to explode. The advocates of CLS believed the civil rights movement had been exhausted, and so of course their approach was far more radical. Unfortunately for them, the majority of them were white and male. The race-conscious scholars therefore saw critical legal studies, regardless of the leftist achievements it had accomplished, as just another white institution that needed abolition. In 1986, the National Critical Legal Studies Conference was held at Pine Manor College in Massachusetts. The white leftists invited race scholars to lead discussions in a workshop centered around race relations. What they didn't know was that the scholars had designed their workshop to call out and undermine the white leftist CLS workers themselves. Of course, when the critical eye was turned back on the leftists, pandemonium ensued, and they suddenly became defensive when they were asked, what is it about the whiteness of CLS that discourages participation by people of color? In one fell swoop, the movement was dead. And from the ashes arose the critical race theory movement, which is still alive and kicking today. After another gap of years, in 1989, a few scholars met to discuss the burgeoning race-conscious movement taking place. Among them were Kimberly Crenshaw, Richard Delgado, Mary Matsuda, Derek Bell, and Linda Green. This meeting was the 1989 Critical Race Theory Workshop, and was held at the University of Wisconsin Law School and the Holy Wisdom Monastery. From their own writings, they admit that CRT as an organized movement began there. The fundamentals of CRT are discussed in different parts of this video, so I won't elaborate on them here. This piece of the timeline is important for bringing many of the central activists together and being the time when the actual term CRT was coined. Also in 1989, Judith Katz made a resurgence with another book called The Challenge of Diversity. This center of society that Bell Hooks described was to be laid out in detail by Katz. White European culture became the foundation of US institutions and cultural norms, which always made people of color feel uncomfortable and excluded. She said this was because white culture was the only legitimate one. Of course, common sense says otherwise, but Katz was functioning on legitimation by pyrology. She detailed a large list of aspects of white culture, which amounted to nothing more than stereotypes, really. These aspects of white culture were fundamental to America and needed to be abolished. They are quite ridiculous, but I'll cover them in detail later when the Smithsonian uses them in 2019. They came directly from the proto-critical race theory movement a few years prior to Katz. But before we get there, more dialectical progression is needed. 